Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Before we begin our program, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of today as we recognize Holocaust Remembrance Day. We are so excited to have you all here with us today. My name is Dori Chait, and I'm co-chair of Jewish Professional Women's Committee alongside Tracy Fruman. I am also co-chairing today's fourth annual Letters to My Younger Self, which is one of my favorite programs. I want to thank my co-chairs, Heidi Topaz and Robin Belsky, who is also the moderator of today's program, for all of their hard work to make today possible. Before we get started on this awesome program, I have a few housekeeping items that I wanna review. Please send your questions via the chat. This will be monitored by our team. And if we have time at the end of the program, we will get to as many questions as possible. Also, please keep yourself muted during the program so we can hear the speakers read their letters and their responses to the questions that are asked of them. Now I wanna introduce you to my friend and co-chair, Robin Belsky. Robin is founder and president of Tavern Green Associates, a healthcare strategic planning and international brand marketing company. Clients include Global Fortune 100 and 500 Pharmaceutical, Biotech, Diagnostic, Medical Device, Medical Insurance, and Venture Capital Private Equity Companies. Robin has 27 years of healthcare product development, healthcare policy writing, governmental lobbying, and global market research experience. It is important to note that Robin is also the founder of this program, Letters to My Younger Self. Robin, thank you for being our moderator today. And without further ado, I am so excited to introduce Beth Blauer to all of you here today. Beth is the Associate Vice Provost for <clears throat> Public Sector Innovation at John Hopkins University. She is the former Executive Director and co-founder of the Centers for Civic Impact at Johns Hopkins University. She has successfully worked with over 140 mayors from around the globe to advance the use of data and evidence. Prior to leading the Centers for Civic Impact, Beth designed and launched Socrata's GovStat platform, excuse me, for federal, state, and local governments. She is a recipient of the 2012 CAP Award for her work on Maryland State Stat. Welcome, Beth. Hi, thanks for having me. So happy to be here. And I'm going to just go ahead and start to read my letter. Dear Beth, you are stronger than you could ever imagine. Your most valuable characteristic is that you are unafraid to roll up your sleeves and face life's biggest challenges with a focus and resiliency that will be a model for your family, your community, and believe it or not, the world. You are not an imposter, even though you often feel that way. You are the definition of self-made and is something that you should be incredibly proud of. You're also not defined by your trauma, but you are defined by how you show up to love in its deepest provisions and its capacity to be passed along. Today I'm writing to the young girl who met a boy at a rock and roll bar in Camden Town, London, and came home and told her family that she had just met her husband. That same woman who couldn't understand why everyone around her failed to see the beauty in love at first sight. I'm here to applaud you for following your heart and trusting your instincts because that man, he is the love of your life. And whether you feel this way now or not, your marriage is one for the history books filled with more joy, love and laughter than you could have ever imagined, the envy of many eyes. Today, I'm writing to the exhausted first year lawyer who took a job on Wall Street that felt wrong from the very beginning. That wrong feeling was right all <laughs> along. The torture you felt when you called out sick on the morning of September 11th because you were injured and waiting on an appointment, an injury that kept you from the real life trauma of being in the World Trade Center complex on that fateful day. The same feeling that told you to return home and return to your passion of helping others. That feeling guides you to a career that will exceed all your expectations and a career that will provide for you and your family in ways you cannot imagine right now. Today, I'm writing to the gutsy lawyer turned juvenile probation officer who had the courage to confront some of the most egregious failures of our social system. 
to the young woman who faced the bureaucracy and had the nerve to speak out about the injustices that were levied day in and day out against our state's most vulnerable children. While you sit at your desk and wonder if you actually are too loud or care too much, trust yourself. These children deserve better. You know that. And if you silence yourself, their harm propagates. You know you can do better and the system can do better. Keep pushing. You will make lasting changes. Today, I'm writing to the woman who was asked to leave her work in juvenile services to join the governor's office. You always stayed away from politics and you didn't want to be thrown into a spotlight. But you also knew that applying your analytic skill and your ability to use data and solve hard problems had the same potential to change the lives of children as it will to improve the health of our Chesapeake Bay, our education outcomes across our state, or ending childhood hunger and the critical outcomes that are at the heart of our state's work. You felt like you weren't old enough or smart enough. You come home and lament, why are you giving this enormous, why were you given this enormous responsibility? But you do it, you make a difference. You leave behind massive violence reductions. You improve academic outcomes. You move the needle on Bay Health, infant mortality, and much more. You lead field-defining work that will forge a path for you that is absolutely life-changing. You need to stop and appreciate the bounty of your hard work. You welcome two children in your time with the state and you rush back to the office just weeks after giving birth. Take more time. Please take the time. You should savor every moment with your growing family. You should spend less time on your Blackberry worrying about what you are missing. Stop, breathe, look at this beautiful family. Your work is marvelous, but your home is a marvel. Your decision to have Oren stay home and raise your children is one you will never exceed. It was a stroke of genius despite the massive sacrifice. Oren pours himself into your children in a way you could never manage. The children are his absolute masterpiece. I am writing to the woman who, at the top of her career, is standing in the ICU at Johns Hopkins University, facing the news that the man, the love of her life, the center of her family, and the whole of her heart is dying. That he only has weeks to live and there is no hope. As you fall to the floor in despair with a chorus of I can't do this running through your mind, I'm writing to tell you that you can do this that you are doing this, that you will get through this with the help of your community and your family and the friends that showed up that day and have never left your side. I am writing to the torture, the cruelty and sadness you feel every day. It weakens, you learn to live with it. Your life feels different, but it is still unbounded and limitless and it still affords wonder and love and even the occasional moments of happiness. Mm -hmm. You will find comfort in your faith, in the Jewish customs of Shiva and Yortzite. A reconnection to your Jewish roots also gives way to remembrance and a celebration of a life well-lived, a life that embodied heaven on earth and everything that means. And finally, I'm writing to the woman who observed a growing disease in China, and your instinct was that mayors and governors across the nation need to brace for a life-changing pandemic. That feeling of doom when you saw the first signs of what was coming and you put all your work on hold to start pouring through data and sharing it with the world. To the woman that leads this data work day in and day out for the globe while juggling being an only parent, navigating virtual learning, isolation, and the collective trauma of a global pandemic, I'm writing to tell you, you need a vacation. You need to spend uninterrupted time with your beautiful children <clears throat> that when this is all over, you need to stop, you need to breathe, and you need to know that you are enough, that I am proud of you, that you are not an imposter, and that what you have done, that you have done this, and that you are loved by many, but by especially me. Beth, what an amazing letter. And I want to thank you so much for pouring your heart into a letter. And I want the audience to know that these letters come straight from the heart of our panelists. We don't get into them and edit them. This is an honest, straight from the heart letter. And Beth, thank you. 
I'm going to move into the questions and I'm going to start with talking about your Wall Street experience. You mentioned in your letter and I quote, today I am writing to exhausted first year lawyer who took a job on Wall Street that felt wrong from the very beginning, end quote. And after you left this job, you became a juvenile probation officer, then worked for the governor of Maryland, and now at Johns Hopkins. Many of us participating in this event have felt that we were in the wrong job at the wrong time, and maybe have had the unsettling feeling of being stuck in that job. Would you, sh would you share more about making the bold decision to leave Wall Street making the transition to returning to Maryland and have had the, pardon me, um, Maryland, while at the same time changing your entire career? Sure. So I think we all are motivated to find um, work by passion, especially when I first came out of college and I was headed to law school. I, I really felt in a very profound, real way that I wanted to have an impact on the world. Um, and that I knew that there were underrepresented people in my community and I wanted to go to law school to learn so that more skills so that I could be a better advocate, a better partner with the community. Um, but I also went to New York, I went to school in New York City, uh, which was expensive. Um, I, I loved living in New York City um, and while you're in school, especially if you're a great student, um, you get courted by these jobs that have could be life changing for you. And for me, I, you know, I'm a self starter. I was putting myself through school, um, and I, I definitely thought that I could, for a short period of time, take this role uh, and work on Wall Street. And um, it was a nightmare. It was just everything that had motivated me to go into law. Um, you know, it was sort of the opposite of that work. Um, I wanted to help people. I wanted to create wealth. Um, I wanted to create opportunity. Uh, and, um, you know, what I was doing was just completely unaligned with my core values. And I could feel that from the moment I started. And I was making all kinds of deals with myself, uh, rationalizations. I'm going to do it for a short period of time. I'm going to pay off my student loans. I'm going to do these things. Um, and then you have these shocks in your life. Um, and 9-11 really was a shock for me uh, where I realized like, what am I doing? I, I'm making all of these rationalizations to myself and I don't need to, and I can figure out a way um, to engage in the work that's a, that's a passion of mine and do it in a way uh, that I feel really good about and, I, and I'll survive, I'll make it. And so, you know, leaving New York was probably one of the hardest things I ever did. I love living there. I always say that I can't wait to go back and retire in New York City. We'll all be able to live on, um, you know, uh, bodega coffee and and one one banana a day. Um, and so I, I but I, it was the best decision that I made for myself because it really allowed me to see um, an opportunity that I never even imagined for myself. Um, and then working in government was probably. Um, you know, I took that job temporarily, like I'll be that I'll get it'll get me into court, I'll be able to figure out what was going on um, uh, with the system and where I wanted to be. And it turned out that that job on the front lines of government opened up a, a piece of my heart and my mind um, that has stayed with me. And it's really been my kind of guiding light, uh, that experience on the front line, knowing that you can actually change um, the trajectory of people's lives if you actually invest in them in the right ways. Um, has been at the center of everything that I've done since then. And I, it feels like a, a it feels like I've been catapulted into the work that I'm doing now. Uh, but for me, it, it was it, it just every every turn made sense from that moment on when I decided that I was going to invest in the things that meant most to me. Well, thinking back on your Wall Street experience, how did you overcome that feeling of feeling stuck? A lot of people uh, go through the overanalysis is paralysis. They stay in a job for a long time. But how did you get through or bust through that feeling of being stuck? I mean, like I said, like that shock, it really just kind of forced this like conversation with myself, um, which was like, what am I doing? You know, we were not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, and we were, you know, so. I could rationalize staying in that stuck moment for the rest of my life. Um, and 
the reality was I didn't want to feel that way for one more day. And, and that really was what made all of the decisions from there to leave New York, to, to take a job um, where I was going to be get, getting paid a 10th of what I was being paid. Um, and, and really it, it, it made it all, it, it brought a, a peace and a confidence in me um, uh, that um, I, I, I really, you know, out of tragedy, I can really value in a way that I think a lot of Americans actually did the same thing where we saw this collective moment where we all took a pause and said, you know, what are we doing? Um, and, and I remember those moments really vividly after 9-11 um, uh, because a lot of people were going through the same kind of self-reflective moment. Um, and, and, and so, but change is hard. Um, and oftentimes, um, sometimes the, the hardest part is that first decision just to, to, to stop and to, and to really uh, dock into what's most important to you. And thinking about your future job transitions after Wall Street, how did that experience help you jump to other jobs and go on to other jobs and make that transition possibly sooner or later? Share with us some advice about that. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that, um, especially as a woman that I felt um, was that I wasn't good enough um, or I wasn't smart enough to be competitive. And what I learned, um, especially working um, uh, on uh, in, in, in the financial industry was that I was, I'm fine. I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. Like th this is, you know, I can figure this stuff out. Um, and some of that confidence is key and it really did, you know, and my legal training also, um, being able to cross-examine, to think critically about, um, what's happening to really just question, um, facts, um, has been one of the, I think at the center of why I am, um, where I am today, um, probing information in a way. And so I think one of the things that I, I cherish most about that experience is that it, it really contributed to my kind of gutsy attitude that I was able to take out of that environment. It was cutthroat. Um, I was one like of a three women that worked at this hedge fund. Um, it was, you know, a very male dominated, very white, very um, oppressive uh, work environment. And I was successful. They lamented the departure as much as I lamented, um, as much as I didn't lament departing. Uh, and so that, you know, I mean, I took that with me, but look, I started, you know, um, I started there, you know, I had a tremendous economic opportunity and then I came to Maryland and, you know, coming out of law school, I, I was looking at a mountain of debt and now I was accepting a job working as a probation officer for $29,000 a year. Um, that was a shock to the conscience. And it also, you know, deeply informed my value. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think it was probably the most important work that I ever did. And it's the most undervalued work. Uh, there is. And I think that, you know, it also has, a, has kind of guided me through a lot of the advocacy I've done in the later part of my career. And, and thank you for that, by the way. I'm going to move on to your role and your job roles at Johns Hopkins. Beth, you have worn several important hats where you have had to roll up your sleeves and by God, get into the muck while working at Johns Hopkins University. One of those jobs was the former executive director and co-founder of the Centers for Civic Impact. And currently you hold the job of the Associated Vice Provost for Public Sector Innovation. Please tell us about each of these job roles and what responsibilities you have had. And now what are the different responsibilities of what you are doing now? Sure, so I've been in Hopkins now for almost seven years. And um, I first started um, at Hopkins um, and I launched the Center for Government Excellence to really meet the needs of mayors globally, um, to understand how they can use data and align data to some of the most difficult problems that they're navigating. Um, we built as part of GovX an academy that's been training you know, thousands of public sector workforce members on how they can integrate more data use into their advocacy and the, and the work that they're doing um, in defining some of the most critical programs that are key components of our social safety nets um, and of the 
of, of our civil society, um, redefining what it means to be a city and to be an inclusive city and one that um, uh, actually meets the needs of people. Um, and it was in that work that I built a data team um, and, um, and that we really started looking um, at ways that we could also um, produce data and think about data um, as a service. Um, and uh, we also um, were at the center, um, uh, were looking towards um, some travel in, in, in 2020. Um, and we were looking to understand this nascent uh, disease that we knew um, was in China uh, in January of that year. Um, and when we started to do a scan, some of the best information around this nascent virus was here at Hopkins. And, um, and we knew that we needed to get this information out into the public. And so really for the last two plus years um, or two years, um, feels like 20. Um, uh, I've been the data lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center here at Johns Hopkins University, where I've led all the public data visualization um, that has been at the center of a lot of um, um, the way that all of us individually are informing our public life decisions, um, but also that public policymakers have been relying on to navigate um, this global pandemic. Um, uh, I'm going to interrupt you because I want to talk to you a little bit more about your work with COVID-19. So let me go on to the next question. I apologize for interrupting you, okay. but we're going to get to some of these points. So um, Beth, now that you've described your work roles, let's talk a little bit about a word we unfortunately know so well, and you've already mentioned it. Um, it's COVID-19. I am unsure if the audience is aware that you are managing and don't sell yourself short, you are managing and responsible for the world's most important and relied upon COVID-19 global prevalence figures and other key global pandemic figures. Your work is reported to the highest of highs, the U.S. president, the U.S. government, governors and mayors of every state, and U.S. citizens. And I get one, foreign leaders, and when allowed to their foreign citizens, to scholars and other healthcare data analysts across the globe, and the world relies on your team's daily reporting and trends analysis. It is amazing, Beth. Thinking of your work roles at Johns Hopkins University, what was your job in February, March of 2020, prior to the, we knew it was exploding before then, it was bubbling up in December, um, but prior to February, March 2020, when the world was a buzz and shutdown happened and the, and, and the COVID-19 rise versus how your job role has been impacted and evolved to what it is today in January 2022, and how do you see that job changing in the future? Yeah, so like I said, my world, I mean, it, it, shifted dramatically, um, as all of ours did. And I think that that's something that we don't appreciate is that everyone's life is dramatically different uh, now than it was in uh, December, January, um, uh, 1920. And, you know, I was working, uh, like I said, um, you know, traveling the globe, working with cities, trying to get cities um, to shore up data infrastructure, to align data to outcomes, solving problems, everything from um, uh, whether or not children live within um, uh, adequate amounts of uh, distance to green space, to healthy water, um, to um, uh, violent crime, every, you know, the gamut of public issues that we face. Um, and really, what does that data framework look like that really shapes the way that we think about these things? Um, and then COVID came, um, and I was tasked with this um, opportunity uh, to lead this work um, uh, with our team at Johns Hopkins. And um, it was um, a, a meteoric rise, but also kind of revealed that, in general, we have really underinvested in public health infrastructure for tracking public health crises. Um, and the fact of the matter is it's a role, it, you know, it was a, a role for the WHO and for, you know, national health organizations, but it, that wasn't being met. Uh, and so we really did fill in um, what I thought would be a very temporary fill in until the kind of infrastructure got shored up. Never would I have ever expected 
um, in the spring of 2020 that we would be having this conversation now going into the you know end winter beginning of spring of 2022 that I would still be actively every day focused on COVID tracking. Um, but we are. Um, and I run a team largely of women, which I'm very proud of, our chief data scientist, the chief architect of the data um, maps, um, our, 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 our communications chief, everyone, women. So another um, indicator of how women continue to tend to care for the world. Um, and, you know, the, the reality of the situation is, is that um, we have, you know, sort of been at the, at the center when there was a lot of distrust in government. Um, and a lot of um, shaky ground uh, for policymakers. We really did um, serve a very important role. And I think in the not only has it shifted what we think about in terms of tracking global disease, but also the role of universities. Um, and I think it's dramatically changed um, the utility of our university specifically and how we can be real-time partners in solving problems and, and really translating. Um, science uh, to the world. And so um, it, you know, I think I'm very interested in helping to continue this legacy at Johns Hopkins and also combating what I think is one of the biggest threats to public health, which is misinformation. Um, and one of the, you know, reasons why I think we are such a trusted source is because um, we have an impartiality that we bring into the world and into the work. Um, uh, but all, all things uh, being said, I think that um, there is still a lot of work that we need to do, um, particularly here in the United States, around how we integrate evidence and data and sort of science into uh, the canon of daily life, which we're really failing at right now. Beth, I need to move on to the next questions, and I want to thank you for all you do and all the roads that you've paved, particularly with public health and COVID-19. Um, it's incredible. I'm gonna switch, switch gears and I'm gonna talk about something that you mentioned in your letter, which is um, being an imposter. So a lot of women on the call today have heard the term imposter syndrome and some know what it means and some know, don't know what it means. So imposter syndrome is defined as when an individual doubts their skills, talents, and accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. You mentioned that when you worked for the governor's office, you believed you were inadequate for the job. And I quote, you felt like you weren't old enough or smart enough to take on and analyze the hard issues facing the state of Maryland, such as Maryland's youth, the health of the Chesapeake Bay, state education outcomes, childhood hunger, and more. And you shared that you felt like an imposter, even though you excelled in this role. Beth, you mentioned imposter syndrome in your letter, and many participating today have had the feeling that they too are imposters in their jobs. Why do you think this feeling is so common among females in positions of power and influence? And I'm going to ask you to be a little bit brief because I have a couple more questions. Okay. Today. Well, I mean, aside from the patriarchy and oppressive oppression and the, all of the things that we know uh, lead to why women uh, have difficulties understanding their worth in the workplace, um, I think it's you know I think for us, uh, especially as a woman. Um, it, you know, the, the, we idealize knowledge and we really, I think, build up in our minds what success looks like. Um, and um, it's so hard to see it in ourselves. And so I think my imposter sy sy syndrome is, is directly connected to just like never being satisfied. But I also think the flip side of that is, is also why I've been able to push myself in my careers because I, I'm, I'm chasing something, whether that's realistic or not, um, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I will never be satisfied. Okay. So you're also a working mother and we have an audience that contains many working mothers and you have been in the highest of job positions while raising your children. And now in those positions as a single mother. If you were mentoring one of our attendees, what is the one greatest piece of advice you would offer as they embark on their careers as a working mother? 
Well, if you're fortunate enough to have a good relationship with your mom, keep it. Cause I <laughs> certainly would not be able to do anything that I do without my mom. Um, so that's my first piece of advice. Um, but my second piece of advice is um, to don't make perfect enemy of good uh, to laugh and to, you know, you're going to, you know, I surprise myself still. I find myself in the most uh, insane situations with the kids. Um, and we have to take moments just to laugh because if, you know, if you're not laughing, you're definitely crying. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, you know, count your blessings and certainly make sure you bring some humor into your life. Okay, thank you. Good advice. Loss is a life quake. The New York Times bestselling author, Bruce Feiler, writes in his book entitled Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age about something called life quakes. And he says a life quake is a massive shock and or change that leads you to a life transition. Beth, you share that you unfortunately lost your greatest love, your husband. Oren and your husband, Oren, and from reading your letter, I would say that this was a very unfortunate life quake. How has losing your husband, Oren, influenced your perspective on juggling parenthood and career? You know, one of the things that happened right after Oren was diagnosed with cancer was that for him, like he could not tolerate small talk. He cut it out of his life completely. And every time anyone walked into the bedroom or to be with him, he just wanted to be direct and have real conversations about life. And he said to me in that period of his life, he was like, I don't have real conversations with people, including the kids and don't stop doing that. You know, we spend so much time uh, having superficial connection with each other, make real connection. Um, and it stayed with me. Um, and my tolerance now for small talk is very de minimis. Um, I am direct. If you know me, many of my friends are here participating in this conversation. Um, I, you know, I think that one of the things that that life quake definitely taught me was that um, if you want something, if you need something, say it advocate for yourself, advocate for your children, um, engage with the kids. They are thinking, feeling human beings. Um, don't, you know, um, be direct with them. Don't be a truth teller. Um, all of these things have emerged, um, since, um, we've gone through this trauma as a family. Um, we have some of the most intense real conversations. Um, and I think it's really defining who we are, not only as a family, but also who the kids are as individuals. And I have one last wrap up question for you. If you were to look into your future when the world is no longer in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic and the world seems a bit more normal, let's hope, what is the next step for you? Well, definitely a vacation, a sabbatical. I need some time off, um, but you know, I love Baltimore. Um, I, I think um, it is the greatest city in America. Um, I feel very strongly about the community here in Baltimore. And so I do see myself spending a lot more time focused on this city and, and how we can um, really let the city live into its potential. Thank you. And I am going to turn the tables back over to Heidi Topaz, my other co-chair. And you're on, Heidi. Okay. Thank you, Beth, for your beautiful letter. And thank you, Robin, for your thought-provoking questions. My name is Heidi Topaz, and I am a member of JPW. This is my second year co-chairing this event. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Brenda Brown Reaver. From advocating and providing services for women in abusive situations through the founding of HANA, the Counseling Helpline and Network for Abused Women, to empowering and educating young girls at the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women, to preserving the oral histories of women over, 70, over 75 at the Jewish Women's Archive. Brenda Brown Reaver has helped shape women's stories and been shaped by them in return. Brenda remains actively involved in HANA, the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women and the Jewish Women's Archive. 
Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, first, I would like to say that I am um, very honored to share this with Beth. Her story was beautiful and um, admirable. And so I only wish her good luck in the future. Um, now the letter to my younger self. Dear Brenda, you have always been filled with fire and spirit, and you are a lucky girl too. You won't realize until you are older that a good part of the luck was being born into your family. Your father, the super showman and extrovert, was always very proud of you and your accomplishments. Your mother, the more laid back parent, was always there for you. She loved spending time with you and listening to all your stories. She would look at you at times in awe because you were so filled with personality and confidence, which came directly from your dad's DNA and your mom's very positive mothering and your brother. He was always, always your protector, always looking out for you, always quietly proud. And I thank him all the time for it has continued throughout my entire life. But I wish I could go back and thank our mom and dad for all that they had done. I think that you should know that your family will always be the foundation on which you stand and you will always pay it forward onto your own wonderful children. You will have three. You will teach them that love and loyalty make family. United we stand. In your worst moments, in your 20s, the worst because you were the most unprepared, you will realize that your family will always support you, but you will learn that you can only rely on one person in your life, and that is you. You will grow up quickly at 27, and you will never be that very carefree, very young, very naive girl again. You will become a woman overnight. Adversity will serve to make you stronger in life. Remember, life is complicated. There will be sad times. However, some things in your life that you feared the most will actually turn out to be a relief, even divorce after 30 years of marriage. Aware of my background, some people have asked, if I could change one thing in my life, what would it be? Surprisingly enough, it would be my major in college. It was elementary education and it should have been business. It would have put me on a different trajectory. Please try to forgive me. It was a different time and there were different expectations for nice Jewish girls in the 1961 and 60s. I didn't give a lot of thought to any grand schemes in my life, and I didn't really have a master plan for the future. What was expected? Get your college degree, get married, have kids, stay home, take care of them, and have a teaching degree. As my father always said, quote, in case God forbid something bad happens, you could always have that to fall back on. I did exactly as expected. Marriage at 20, finish college at 21, children at 22 and 24, and then the caboose at 35. Old age for a mama for then, but young <clears throat> to have a child today. You will be in your 30s or 40s when you recognize that you like being a leader. You know the type, being in charge. You will become aware of your strengths and your weaknesses. You are an idea person, a strategic thinker, but not a detailed person. You will see the entire forest and not realize that it is made up of many individual trees. You will always need someone on your projects who does see each individual tree and perhaps not the forest. In other words, someone who could dot your I's and cross those T's. You will learn that the people you choose to be part of your team are extremely important. They become ambassadors, supporters, and advocates for your vision. You will chair some organization boards and found some organization boards and chair them, and you'll help to found others. You will enjoy networking, raising money for two organizations you founded, HANA, the only safe house for Jewish women in Baltimore, and the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women, a public charter school for underserved girls. 
In both undertakings, you will feel as if you were opening and running a business. Here is an important thing for you to know going forward, and this is straight for me. I realized, and you will also, that I actually enjoyed raising money for causes I cared about and believed in. In fact, I loved it and found it fun and rewarding, and I was good at it, as you will be. So if you read my resume, let me assure you, it was not necessarily brilliance that led me on all those boards. It was my not so hidden talent for being able to raise money. I think you should know that I had a theory about philanthropy, which you will learn along the way from more established philanthropists than yourself. That theory is not to give your philanthropic dollars away, but to think of them as an investment in the future of an organization's mission. You will enjoy seeing your dollars and ideas produce results and fund projects that will make a difference in the lives of many. One other thing that is vitally important as a leader of any organization is to make sure it's being run in a fiscally responsible way and that there is a healthy bottom line. And Brenda, one more thing about your professional life. People will tell you that you have to achieve success in your 40s. That is not true. I didn't do any of what I consider my cornerstone projects until I was in my 50s. There's a lot to be said for the empty nest syndrome as well as postmenopausal efficiency. And I founded the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women at age 65. Interesting because I was told at 53 I had aged out of being a leader in one organization. It is important to realize that when one door closes, another opens. I have loved my new endeavors and the leadership roles I've had in them. I've also loved reuniting and being on the board of the University of Maryland that I graduated from. And it has been important for since my 50s and continuing to the present. Age is just a number. Keep your mind as active and alert as you can. Your professional life will be extremely fulfilling and bring you lots of skills in a multiplicity of areas. You will also get to meet and strategize and learn so much from very interesting and diverse people. You must always remember to be open and gracious to all you meet. I remember always smiling in the Pikesville giant because you never knew who was around the corner, a possible donor, a coworker, a friend. How did this all happen? Well, you always had good, good friends growing up. It was a very important part of your life. As you live more of your life, you will encounter many people, some from your personal life and some from your philanthropic worlds. Some of the people you interact with will become your very good friends. These new friends joining with the old will remain as a constant in your life. They are how you make your way and succeed in the adult world. Those friends, all of them from your various endeavors, are what we today call a network. The people you've inspired and that have inspired you are as a, an essential part of your life and your philanthropic journey. And Brenda, Believe me when I tell you that without that network, you would be one, lonely, two, unsupported in life, three, unable to raise the money for all the projects you care about, and four, unable to put together boards of smart, savvy, energetic, caring, and compassionate people on whom you rely. You will love the things you do and the people around you. I think the people you will work with and partner with who become your friends or were your friends and family and come along with you will probably be the outstanding part of your life. You will have superlative teams along the way who you will always remember to thank for their guidance and their support. In everyone's life as there were in mine, there will be deaths and illnesses of those you dearly love but you will have the strength to deal with what confronts you. Just always remember that life is about taking care of yourself and those you love. I also need to tell you that in your life, you will come across some people, to put it rather bluntly, that you just can't trust. 
and you will figure that out in time. The good will stick, the others will fall away, and you will be happy that they did. A couple more things, one about your kids. You will innately know and always understand that whatever you put into them when they are young and growing up, love, lots of time, attention, worry, always being their advocate, will be more than given back to you in respect and admiration in your lifetime. You will always feel surrounded by their love. Eventually in your life, you will love and trust and be loved by a wonderful man who will show you that marriage can be fun and fulfilling and wonderful if you choose well. He has been and is my supporter in all I do. What a wonderful feeling. Another added bonus being on the board of the University of Maryland where we met. Think of him as a reward. I do. My secret in life, always do what you care about the most because that is what you're going to do the very best. And also, it is important that you care about and put your heart and soul into making life better for others. Women will be of particular interest for you as they are the ones who you realize need to be protected, elevated, educated, and empowered. You will always care about your Judaism, but you must look around and take risks and venture out of your little world. Remember, Tikkun Olam means repair the word world for all, not just for some. And when I look at our Seder, Seder table now, it sort of resembles the United Nations. Don't fear change. Sometimes it really is for the best. Life is not always a smooth ride. So I'm going to tell you to wear your seatbelt to protect your body. And if you need to, and you will, talk to someone to get your head straight. And Brenda, remember, you don't enter the world as a confident, successful woman. You have time to work on all of that through all the things that you accomplish in life. And dear Brenda, always, always be who you are. You will like yourself. You really will. This is with love from me, your older self. Thank you. Brenda, what an amazing letter. And guess what? I like you and I like yourself. So <laughs> I want to jump in to asking you uh, some questions. And I want to share that we are running a little bit over and a note just went up to the audience that we may be extending our time about 10 minutes. So if you have the time to stay with us, we would greatly appreciate it. Let me dive in. Um, I would like to talk to you about a Hana. And you know, Hana is near and dear to me. I sit on its board and I sit on it, its executive board. One of your greatest achievements for which our Jewish community and the greater Baltimore community are beyond grateful for is that in 1995, you saw a grave need in our community and stepped up with vigor and founded Hana. We cannot envision our community without it. For those who do not know, HANA responds to the needs of people who have experienced abuse or trauma and is dedicated to helping those who are victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, elder abuse, and all forms of interpersonal violence. I want you to know that this is an associated agency and counsel and support are available at any stage of a victim's abuse or trauma cycle. I'll hop into the questions. Please share what was the pivotal point that made you realize there was a community need for HANA. Okay, well, I'm gonna to try to make it short. Um, I was the president of the women's division department at that time at the Associated, and uh, we did a strategic plan. Out of the strategic plan came the fact that the women didn't just wanna be asked for money. They wanted to be able to help other women in the community. And one of the things that came up was that there were women that were being abused and it was a very quiet sort of thing happening. So first we went to meet, I went to meet with rabbis, I went to meet with the uh, family 
Jewish Family Services. And everybody said, no, actually, there's none of that is going on. And I knew that it was. So I had to keep digging. And somebody said to me, call Hannah Weinberg. And I did. She was the Rebbitzin um, and uh, at Near Israel. Her husband was the president, was the rabbi there. And they said, call her, meet with her. So I did. And she told me that she had gone for at least three or four years to try to get something done because at that present moment while we were talking, she had nine women that she was hiding in different homes in the non-Jewish community in Baltimore. And she said, there is such a tremendous need. Once she opened up, I then went to several other rabbis where I knew that these women had gone to synagogue. And it turned out everybody then started to tell me stories. So. Basically what happened was we had women who wanted to support it, who felt that they they wanted to help women and they wanted to help in a very specific manner. We raised $300,000 in two weeks. Um, we got the uh, House of Ruth who knew a lot about it as a partner. We, the women's department chaired the whole thing and we were, it was, it came to be, it was wonderful. And the community came together and the women who wanted to help actually formed a 24 hour hotline um, that was run by a lay person. And we had sessions where we trained all these women. I think everybody felt those that were helped and those that were doing the help, that it was an absolute need in our community. So Hannah is 27 years old. And since its formation, um, do I have that wrong? 27 years old? I think it's, I counted 25, but okay. Okay. So 1995, it was formulated. Maybe I've done my math wrong. Um, so since its formation, would you share what Hannah was like in its early days and what it has grown into today? Well, in its early days, we had a cadre of people that cared about it very much. I would say there were 25 to 50 women who really cared about it. And they sat at home with a phone on their desk. They had different times and I did it as well. And I only prayed during the time, please don't let the phone ring. Because I knew my instinct would be to say, where are you? I'll come get you which is of course the wrong thing to do. We were trained not to do that. Um, so I think, let me say this, Hannah has been blessed. I believe God blessed Hannah. From the very beginning, our first executive director was Shelly Hedelman, who you all know. And we went from there until we get today to Lauren Shavitz. And I'm going to tell you, and Nancy Aiken, who did like 18 years of it, we were, blessed. These people, I believe, were given to us. Really, I'm a spiritual person. I believe God handpicked these people. This organization is far beyond anything that I envisioned it would be. And they do so much for so many. And I am very proud of everybody. I'm proud of the board and Linda Katz and all the people that work one and I actually have two nieces on the board, which makes me feel good because it's door la door. And um, I, I, I just think it's well run, well executed, well thought, and it's a strategic uh, uh, organization and always has been. And I agree wholeheartedly on that. And I'm sure many on the call today or on the Zoom today, agree with you 100%, we thank you. Okay, I'm gonna shift talking about the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. Brenda, you have dedicated a great deal of yourself to give back and to Kuno Lum, which means repair the world. And both are the backbone to all of the good work you have done, not only for Baltimore's Jewish community, but also for Baltimore's greater community at large which is vitally important. Another of your many greatest achievements is finding the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women and what an achievement it is. 
Today, the school educates 500 female students in grades six to 12. What was the aha moment when you said to yourself, Baltimore needs an educational institution like the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women? Well, I will say that my daughter, um, the caboose that I talked about, was very instrumental in me doing this. Um, as I mentioned, I was 65 years old and she felt that was quite young. Uh, why not uh, start a school? I thought she was crazy. And she asked me and my husband to go to a school in New York that was their leadership school. And we went for an afternoon and I fell in love with it. And I will tell you, there's a connection between Hana and the Baltimore Leadership School. Because when I went there, these girls were sixth graders and they were, they had been there for three weeks and they had a summer program and they were so confident and had such self-esteem and explained a lot of things to us. And I turned to my husband and I said, do not tell this to Amanda, but I think I should have started with a younger age. And that was the start of it. I looked at it and I thought, you know, really these young girls, they're gonna be good. They're gonna have a lot of fortitude, which helps. It doesn't necessarily make it the be all and end all. But I then met Ann Tish, who was responsible for all these schools and my daughter met with us. And she said, you know, my mother could do this in Baltimore. She has the network and she has the fortitude and she loves women and education and so that's how it happened and i will say that we have graduated six classes all of them graduated and all of them were accepted to an accredited college and we are very proud of them and we're probably one of the only schools in the united states of america that actually had a movie made about us called step which my daughter did and so, I mean, the school has been blessed as well. That's all I can tell you. It has to do with the, the stars being in alignment and the girls who have come out of the school thus far, just so proud of them. I mean, we have Hopkins graduates and we have women that are working at Amazon and at Google and we have a, a, someone online, um, whatever they call those people that, that amass millions of people and tell them what makeup to wear. She's making over $100,000 a year now doing what she does. And she graduated from the University of Maryland College Park. That's amazing. That's amazing. When you were formulating the school, when you were beginning to formulate the school, for lack of a better term, were there any hiccups along the way? Oh, many hiccups. It's a charter school. They didn't want um, another charter school in Baltimore and it's very difficult but you know what it's all what I say it's this is what I want to tell really the young women out there and and who are in business the most important thing when you're forming an organization and this was true with every organization I was with where I was chair of the board I sat and I thought who do I need to have around this board what chairs need to be filled what do they, what does each one need to bring? What do I not have and other people not have that are special? And that's what we did with the Baltimore Leadership School. And we had lawyers, we had doctors, we had um, uh, a deans of school, we had the chancellor of the Maryland, uh, University of Maryland. Um, we had an absolutely fabulous board. And I'm happy to tell you that of the 25 board members that founded um, Bliss, currently 15 founding board members still are on that board all these years later. That's so amazing. it's a loved uh, thing, like Hannah. So switching gears, you mentioned observing your family's Passover table. And I quote you, it now kind of resembles the United Nations, end quote. You go on to say, quote, don't fear change. Sometimes it is really for the best. Whoops. This world, this analysis, 
and I believe you really believe that, would you please give the audience more detail on why you found it important to share this? I, I think it was important to share because my life has grown, changed, been enriched through all the things that I did. Um, I, I'm still very Jewishly active and have a very Jewish heart, but I also am very inclusive of the world generally. I grew up thinking that Jews were the majority of the world because that's all that I grew up with. Um, and that, that wasn't so. But I wanna answer this with two questions that came up. When I was walking through the school pre-pandemic, um, there was a chemistry class going on and one of the teachers, and I knew all the teachers by name and the kids, um, said, oh, Miss Reaver, um, we were just talking about you and the girls have two questions to ask. Would it be okay if they asked their questions? I said, yes. So one raises her hand and she says, um, Miss Brown Reaver, are you rich? And I said, you know, I am very rich in my friends and my family and the people who support what we do. That's how this school was done because a lot of people believed that it was important and they were attached to me in part of my network. So yes, I'm very rich in having people that, that I can get some money from to help all of us here. And then the second one raised her hand and she said, we all know that you're Jewish, which I found interesting. Was, did your Judaism lead you to do this school? Or what about your Judaism okay. led you to Interesting. This? And this is, you know, like a 10th grader in chemistry. And I thought it was a wonderful question and I loved it. And I said, yes, I said it did have a big part in doing this school because Judaism believes in tikkun olam, repairing the world. So we have to help all of those that we see and come in contact with. And so Takuna Lum told me I needed to do a school. And I didn't say it to them, but I'll say it to you all. The school is 98% African American. And it's taught me a whole lot about being inclusive and uh, having people that are my friends that are uh, diverse in many situations and understanding them. And the Talmud teaches us that the highest wisdom we can have is kindness. And I think that looking at my Seder table, um, they're very kind people sitting there. That's what's important. And I've learned a lot from them. Thank you. Okay, you shared your cornerstone projects were not accomplished until your 50s and that the best was yet to come. Our audience today come from all ages, and many are currently making changes in their professional jobs as well as in their philanthropic volunteerism. This trend typically is normal. However, this is especially exacerbated in these times of COVID-19. Tell us your secret to having the guts to start over or start and try, try again, to change your personal missions, to improve your life's course and enhance your life's own personal satisfaction. Well, I never thought of anything in my life as starting over again, okay? Um, I just, I thought of my life as a continuum um, and finishing one project and being attracted to another. I would say for those people that the most important thing that you can do in life if you want to do some really wonderful things is to risk, risk. You have to risk or you will not achieve what you want to achieve. Um, and get people to help you. Get surrounded by your friends, your family, whoever. Call me if you want. I'm happy to help. I believe in risking and I believe in looking beyond what is right there in front of you. Brenda, I have two more questions for you. Um, in your letter, you stress the importance of creating relationships 
and female friendships. What do you think it is about female relationships and how have these female relationships contributed to your story? Well, I couldn't have done it without my female relationships, that's for sure. And it started at a very early age. Um, you know, I'm so friendly with people that I was in school with in this, from the second grade up and some of them are on this call and they know that what I'm saying is true. So um, I, I think that somebody once said, it was not me and it's not original, that when you have a group of friends, you always know what position they would take. If you say to them, you know, I'm thinking of going to Europe during COVID, okay? You know the ones that you could call that would say, oh, Brenda, that's a fabulous idea. Definitely do, 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 do. And then you know the ones that would say, are you out of your mind? And so here's the bottom line of it. We all know what our friends are gonna say before we ask them. And the good part about that is we don't have to call the ones we don't wanna hear from. We can call the ones that actually want to be behind what we have to say. And so having a large group of women friends, um, they, they have been supportive of me, but I've known which ones to call and when to call them. And <laughs> good, I, good sage I, advice. Yes, yes, I think <laughs> it's so very good. important. And and I I just really want to say that um, I am so I'm so happy to have done this today. I I love meeting Beth, who is totally outstanding, and she could be my new friend. I'm always looking for new friends. Friend, I, I, yes. Go ahead. I have one last question okay. um, for you, okay. just for the sake of time, and I'm sorry for um, cutting this off. I, I swear to you, I could sit here forever with you. So um, sh this is a doozy of a question. It's a thought-provoking question. Share with us what you would like your legacy to be, and if you could elaborate on this. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't think a lot about my legacy. And my daughter it was funny. She said to me at lunch that day when she wanted me to do the school, mom, the school will be your legacy. I said, Amanda, I already have a legacy. I've got Hannah. And she said, more, you'll have more of a legacy. You know, I don't think about that kind of thing in terms of those terms. What I would hope my legacy would be is that my children will say I was a wonderful mother, that I helped them when I needed to help them. No, it's just one more second. This Penny, you're you're on. Um... Oh, is it okay? So I would like I, that that would be a wonderful legacy for me. I would like my husband to say how much he loved me as his wife and my family to say how much they appreciated me doing 40 years of Passover seders and Rosh Hashanah lunches. And, um, and I'd like my friends to always think of me as being a good friend. And that's the one thing I didn't get to say, how to have a good friend is to be a good friend. And I hope that I have been. Brenda, thank you so much. You know that I'm a fan. I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to actually wrap things up and turn things over to Heidi Topaz. Thank you, Robin. And another big thank you to Brenda and Beth for agreeing to share their stories with us. It was incredible. And I hope, ev I hope everyone enjoyed themselves today. Thank you so much for coming. Please consider making a gift to the Associated so that we can continue to do the critical work for our community, such as HANA and our other agencies and programs. Our next JPW program will be in May, so keep your eyes peeled for more information about this. Like all JPW programs, we will be sending out a list of attendees' names, areas of work, and contact information attached to your thank you email. So make sure to take advantage of that list. And that concludes our program for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.